Hi everyone, Talisky123 here, and today I'm going to be reviewing The Web of Fear. It's scary to think that it's been over two years, coming up to three years now, since this story and The Enemy of the World was brought back to us in October of uh, 2013 and you know it's incredible that feels like yesterday when you sat down turned on BBC News or whatever in the morning and just heard that the web of fear was back well most of it at least and you know it's it felt unreal you know pinch me and I, am I dreaming that was what it was like really and yeah, it was just incredible to think now that that was over two years ago and, you know, we've now got this classic back and we've also got the enemy of the world back, which sort of, like, wasn't well regarded before, but now is, now that we can see it all in all its glory. Sadly, there's still episode three missing from this one. There have been rumours about what happened to that and, you know, there were rumours beforehand, really. There have always been missing episode rumours, you had whole doc you had whole channels dedicated to Doctor Who episode rumours back in um its heyday during two thousand thirteen where there really was a lot of speculation going on and you know where there's smoke there has to be some fire and that fire was the Web of Fear and Enemy of the World. Apparently Marco Polo was amongst them as well but that didn't end up getting announced. It still hasn't been announced. Do I think they're hiding it back there? I think I, I hope they are, but deep down I think they're probably not, um, but you know, who knows, you never can tell. Ultimately, the rumours have sort of died out now really, you get the occasional one cropping up, but ultimately now in 2016, missing episode rumours are a thing of the past really. Hopefully they do start up again and we do get some more missing episodes, but for now we have The Web of Fear and Enemy of the World. So taking a look at what we have here now, you have the front cover here, and this is the reversible cover. The normal front cover that you will get does have sort of like the whole um, thing going on here, a bit like, if I just open this up, a bit like the booklet you can see there, It is. it takes up the whole of the front cover, which is unusual, but not a bad thing, but I won't be showing you that today, you can probably find that on Vine and in other reviews. There is the spine, that is what you have on the back, and literally the special features are available now trailer for The Enemy of the World and um, digitally mastered picture and sound quality. Yes, um, I was one of the people who bought this when it first came out for the full price of thirteen ninety nine, I think it was, and was quite miffed off that we didn't even get an animated episode 3, we just got telly snaps, and no special features whatsoever really when you think about it, but, you know, I've moved past that now. Um, it's a shame that we didn't get any special features with this one, but ultimately that's just the way that had to go. And there's the disc you've probably got to look at before, you probably know what it is. You've got that nice um, web of fear, the way it's written there, unlike the usual um, bland writing, you've got that quite stylized writing. And that's also on the booklet as well, which I'll now get out to show you. And you can see that once again, if you want to take a look at that wonderful artwork there. If I can get round to the back now, you have nothing really going on there. But instead, the um, chapter points are written inside, along with some words about the story itself on the left there, with a couple of pictures also. So, a different layout to the one that you would usually get, but, you know, that's not always a bad thing. Now, I have a bit of an odd relationship with this story, and it's partly due to the fact that I used to watch episode one all the time on the Lost and Fa oh, Lost Lost and Found Lost in Time, sorry, DVD um, that was released before we had this find, and you know that was um, very good. You know to watch that first episode and reaching the end and thinking this is all we're going to get, sadly. But you know ultimately I was proved wrong and we did get to see more. But at the same time, you know. When I, because I'd watched that so much, it'd become over familiar. And when I got 
this story and when I go to watch this I start to think should I just skip episode one because I've seen it so many times I know it back to front I can easily just skip that and go on to episode two so there's that temptation and then I think well episode two doesn't really have much going on in it and then episode three is just all telly snaps and that's a bit naff so why don't I just skip straight to episode four where the action really gets going and you know there always is that thing going on for me. Every time I watch the story I think why am I not just starting episode 4 because I know everything up to that point and you know well I know everything all the way through but you know that's where it really gets going that's where it really gets good and you know it's a really odd relationship really and it's not to say the first three parts are bad at all they are very good parts ultimately sadly we can't watch part 3 but that's just the way it is and you know it's an odd relationship I had for this story, sort of like wanting to start with part four, and yes, part four is definitely the best part of this story, um, but we'll get more onto that in a bit. So let's go through this episode by episode. I think I don't usually go through things episode by episode, but this time I will, starting with episode one. Episode one, of course, begins where the enemy of the world left off with the Doctor, Jamie and Victoria having the TARDIS doors open while in flight and everything's going all topsy-turvy. They're at risk of being sucked out and Jimmy has to get to do a control panel and, well, close the doors pretty much. And you know, that's quite an interesting start to Doctor Who's story and I think without prior context that can be a bit uh, weird. Um, but, you know, ultimately, usually if you're going to buy this you'd probably want to get The Enemy of the World as well since they're kind of a set even though they were released as two individual stories. But yeah, that's the way it begins, and you know, that's quite a nice little action-packed beginning, rather than just a same old, same old beginning in the TARDIS. You have a beginning where um, chaos, all hell is breaking loose, and then finally get the return to normality, and then they arrive, um, get trapped in space and whatnot, the web starts appearing around them, the Doctor shifts the TARDIS off a bit, and then they end up in the London Underground, and the London Underground is a very good setting for this story and there's that whole story behind the scenes about how they asked London Transport for permission to use the London Underground and they said nope we can't do that it's too dangerous um, so they went oh okay we'll make our own sets and whatnot and they did and then London Underground thought they were so realistic they ended up complaining because they thought they'd actually used um, the London Underground itself without permission um, but no, they did actually use proper sets and whatnot, and you know, they are very well done, you can see that, it's very atmospheric as well, I mean it's such a good setting for a story, and having the Yetis in there as well, you know, which is such a stark contrast really, and you know, this is a redesigned Yeti now, you've got this um, different design with the eyes going on there, and slightly different body build as well, left less bottom heavy, they did sort of have massive hips in the um, Bobble Snowmen um, and you know it's quite, I, I prefer this design I think ultimately and I think the eyes work very well, just those bright white eyes and you know, it helps that it's black and white as well, obviously black and white makes everything more scary um, but you know those eyes ultimately um, are what works in these dark scenes and skipping forward to actually um, yeah, skipping forward to part four since it is in context, you know, um, those eyes when the Yetis are coming at the Brigadier and his men, or sorry, the Colonel and his men, we'll get onto that in a bit as well, you know, they are quite terrifying as well, and I think that very much does work very well. It's a bit like the Cybermen solar size, but it does have a slightly different quality, and, you know, seeing that in the dark would be quite terrifying. Obviously, the roar is still the sound of a toilet but with reversed or messed around a bit or whatever they did but you know ultimately it is still they are still quite creepy monsters i feel even if at, if you get the lighting wrong then they look like extremely cuddly cuddle cuddly cuddlesome oh cuddlesome big finish story there um but yeah they just you want to give them a hug really is what i'm trying to say here and you know but get the lighting right and suddenly they are completely different they are terrifying they are a menace 
and you know the music helps as well and of course the atmosphere of that London underground setting aids it also. As we go into part two as I say this is the episode where not much really happens you've got the basic setup but you're waiting for stuff to really get going and it's basically just the characters fumbling around the London underground for 25 minutes or so and you also get the um actually I think the meeting between Travis and Jamie and Victoria happens in this episode. I can't, I'm not too sure it might have happened in the previous episode actually. But yeah, Travis of course, who you can see on the cover right there, appeared in the previous Seti story as a much younger traveller and of course is played by um, someone, Jack Watling I think it is actually, who is of course Deborah Watling's father who plays uh, Victoria Waterfield. And you know, that that's not confusing enough, you've also got his daughter in this and Travis. So it's getting a bit all mixed up here. But yeah, he's made up to look older and yeah, you know, it does work very well. I think his performance works very well as well. You know, you get this sort of like gruff old man when in reality he's not that old at all really. He is pretty much the same age as he was back in the um, previous Yeti story. Well, in real life, obviously. Because only a couple of weeks have really passed, it's been, yeah, six weeks because you had the Ice Warriors and the Enemy of the World in between the two Yeti stories. So not that much time at all when you think about it and um, ultimately it is very good makeup there and a very good performance that aids that along as well. And, you know, it, it, sort of, it still feels like the same character but at the same time it has that more of, that more age going on about it obviously and sort of like a grotchety old man more. And I think, you know, Jack Watling does give a very good performance as um, the character of Professor Travers. Episode 3 is all done through telly snaps because the episode itself doesn't exist still, sadly. And you know, what makes that even more sad is that it's the first appearance of Nicholas Courtney as the Brigadier. Or in this story, he's the Colonel. He obviously like, gets promotion to Brigadier in the invasion and basically gets known as the Brig or the Brigadier. Um, ever since then is what he has been and it's interesting to see him here before his unit days and there is the whole um, Lethbridge Stewart book series going on at the moment actually which is set in between the Web of Fear and the invasion of him I'd like to say I'm pretty sure that's the way it is and you know, I haven't read any of them but they do look quite interesting and if you haven't let, read any of them maybe discuss them below tell me what's going on there not big spoilers obviously because I might read them one day um, and I don't want to spoil it for others either, but yeah, you know, um, the Colonel here, it's his first appearance and, you know, he is obviously amazing in this story and Nicholas Courtney does a fantastic job, sets it out straight away and it's well written as well and he was, um, it's interesting that you have this sort of like leader figure who isn't clashing with the Doctor and actually goes along with him as well. But, you know, isn't following him blindly. He does have his own um, things going on as well, his own agendas and whatnot. Um, but ultimately, he does trust the Doctor, and I think that's interesting as well because in this sort of like base under siege era, you have a lot of sort of like these leadership characters clashing with the Doctor and saying, "Oh, get out of my way! I'm trying to do important stuff here, and you're just messing about." And, you know, I think it's it's a nice change to have that sort of um, role in there as well. And, you know, you sort of do have the first appearance of the Colonel in episode two. But that's literally just his foot and it isn't even Nicholas Courtney's. It is um, a stand-in. So, yeah, ultimately the Colonel's first proper appearance we still don't get to see yet. But, you know, it's good to have the rest of his first story um, here for us to watch and enjoy. And then episode four, and as I've said already, it's where the action really gets going. It's where the Colonel takes his men, goes out and tries to get the TARDIS back, and obviously things don't go so well, and you have the Yeti slowly advancing, as I already mentioned with their eyes and whatnot. But you also have the music going on with it as well, that music that um, was often used for the Cybermen back in moon base and the tomb of the side and i believe it was using the tenth planet as well you know it worked very well for them at sort of like bombastic music that sort of like says that the monsters are coming towards you and it also works very well for the yeti here also as they advance and begin their attack you know have those web guns that like spray all the um 
fungus over the um, soldiers and whatnot, and you hear their screams as they die. And you know, it's all very effective stuff, very scary stuff as well. I think, especially for young children, that would very be a very scary scene. And you know, ultimately, it is only the Colonel who makes it out alive of that. And episode four really is a bloodbath when you think about it. When you look at all those men who are with him, and you think he's the only one who makes it out alive. And yet, ultimately, it just helps to establish the threats of the Yeti and the Great Intelligence. And I think that worked very well. And it helps to slim all the cast down for the final two episodes, which are slight, which are quite different from the rest of the story, really, and slightly more um, secluded when you think about it. Um, it. Takes a bit of a different direction, uh, but you know, ultimately. You lose a lot of characters here and establish the threat of the Yeti at the same time. And then you also have um, some other characters going off um, at the same time, sort of like sliding the um, trolley through the web so that they can put the TARDIS onto it from the other side and whatnot. And that is, um, what's his name? Staff Sergeant Arnold, or as um, Chorley calls him, just Sergeant, which angers him because it's not at the right rank for him. And there, he ends up going in there with um, Weems, I believe is the character's name. And then you also have Evans, who is sort of like the Welsh coward who um, doesn't really want to go in there with them for obvious reasons. And, you know, you're sort of like made to despise him as a character, but he's quite a funny character at the same time. Only think about it, um, most of us would probably kind of be like that in that situation, realistically. Um, not all of us, obviously, but you know, sort of like the average person probably wouldn't be um, so heroic. They might not be so sarcastic about it and rude about it, but you know, it's sort of like realistic, I guess. And out of all these people, you would imagine one of them would um, be lacking in a backbone. And you know, to like then you have the um, bit where he takes the mask off Weems um, after he pulls the trolley out and Weems is just lying there dead on it and you know you've got the um, web across it and he just pulls the mask off and you see his dead face I think that's quite an effective um, scene as well it sort of like ties back into that whole idea of gas masks as well I mean I'm not sure whether it was the um, Ninth Doctor two-parter The Empty Child and Doctor Dances that gave me a fear of gas masks or whether I had that fear before and I just exploited it. But even then, even here, the gas masks are still scary before then. And I think that's quite interesting as well. I think that works very well as a horror scene there. And then also you have Captain Knight going off with the Doctor to get some supplies. And the Yeti attack. And sadly that is it for Captain Knight as well. So you have a real bloodbath going on there, and you know, it's quite a shame, really, um, because Captain Knight was quite a likeable character, and you know, that was the end of him, and almost the end of the Doctor as well, if it wasn't for a um, lucky bit of intervention there. Um, but yeah, you can sort of like see by this point that the Great Intelligence is playing games with them, because it could easily have stormed um, HQ and gotten the... Um, well, killed them all really, but ultimately it does play this sort of like a long game with the fungus moving in and the Yeti slay moving in as well. It's sort of like you can tell it's toying with them because what it really wants is the Doctor's mind. And you know, ultimately you have um, that slow build up to that. And I think that works very well because it really does work to establish the Red Surgeons as a threat and the fact that it can play games and the fact that it is manipulating them into that position. It's sort of like at first you're led to believe that they are sort of like fighting this battle, but really the battle is just there as a distraction. It's just there to keep them occupied, it's there to draw the Doctor in and get him in the right position and get all the characters in the right places for the finale. And that's, as I say, when you find that out, that makes the um, last two episodes quite different as well, but of course before that you have the cliffhanger to part four where all this has gone down, you know, you've lost all these men and then two Yeti burst in and then Travis is with them, he's possessed by the great intelligence. But yeah, one problem with that is the way it's shot and the way you just got these two massive Yetis in and then he just pops in between their sol shoulders. It just looks so hysterical just seeing his head in between these two massive creatures and yeah it's supposed to be quite a shocking ending obviously it's a shocking reveal as well 
but at the same time I can't help but laugh when I see that scene I don't know it's just maybe it's just me but it's just quite amusing to see Travis's little head popping up between these massive um, creatures as well especially since he's behind them and not sort of like in front he's not being flanked by them he's just sort of like there lurking in the shadows behind them and that cliffhanger leads us into episode 5 where things take a much calmer turn really and you know you've got the um, doctor trying to figure a way out of this and you know, you've got sort of like the fungus breaking into HQ it's where all things start to break down and you've got that um, it's the final push really or leading up to the final push which comes in episode 6 and I think this is um, this and episode 6 sort of blur together a lot for me um, so I'm going to talk about them both at the same time really because they are very similar in a lot of ways and yeah it's after the battle it's almost the calm but not necessarily you know you've got all the characters getting into position they all come together and then the true villain is revealed um, who was the great intelligence's servant all along sort of like that was an ongoing um, little subplot throughout this who is the traitor you know, it gets brought up multiple times and then you finally find out and then you have that scene at the end where the doctor um, is about to get drained of his mind or that's what we think he's actually about to drain the great intelligence of its mind because he crossed the wires um, but ultimately we don't get to see that happen as Jamie um, sets the Yeti and the heaven to control on the other Yeti and it all works out fine in the end but the Doctor's a bit of a strop because um, it didn't exactly go the way he planned it and um, you know ultimately you begin to think um, what was the point in having a Yeti under your control in the first place? I guess it was more meant as a backup plan. But you know, ultimately, you know, it's sort of his own fault a bit, really. And, you know, you can't really expect them to listen to you in a thing like that, where, as far as they're concerned, they're about to um, drain your mind. And, you know, you still, I think the Doctor's being a bit disagreeable at the end there, where he has this little tantrum. But... You know, you can sort of understand where he's coming from at the same time. And, you know, it's Patrick Charlton. You can't hate Patrick Charlton and the second Doctor for anything they do. And it's quite an amusing scene as well where he's just, like, having a bit of a moan going, Oh, you blumbering Welsh idiot, why can't you just leave things alone? And, you know, it's quite amusing, really. And then you get a whole thing where Charlie's just like, Oh, you're going to be a national figure. Huge success, you've just saved the world. Don't you understand what you've done? The Doctor's like, oh no, oh no and backs away and he, Jamie and Victoria run off into the tunnels to find the TARDIS and that's the end of the story really and it's a very effective um, story at that you sort of have that bit at the end where it's just like well you never know Yeti aren't here but they can't, they won't, might start running the train soon and you think probably won't because um, as it's sort of stated before that they have tried to um, blow up different parts of the tunnels they probably did blow up at least one part to um, stop the advance of the web so you think about it and you know you're not going to have um, people back in already but you know I'm just picking flaws in one line and it's more meant as a funny line at the end there really um, so yeah as I say well, let's get on to my overall thoughts on this so the web of fear is a very atmospheric piece of work and I'm not sure how much that is down to the writing really and how much is down to direction. I think you know there's credit due both ways but it's definitely more down to the direction in this case and I think the writing at times is a bit overrated this one I will say. It does have its um, moments where the plot isn't really going too well. Um, sort of like pacing is a bit off in this story I do find. I think the direction helps to mask that up and really does um, help covering all um, that up really and adds because under all those layers of atmosphere it is hard to tell and uh, there is sort of like the whole thing being blinded by nostalgia in some ways but at the same time you know this does have flaws especially in um, quite a bit of writing I think especially in the pacing as well I mean as I say at the start I um, think why don't I just skip episode 2 as nothing really happens there and you know, sadly that is um, the case really and you know, it's a shame that we don't have episode 3 so it's hard to judge that correctly but ultimately episode 3 um, is sort of like, it isn't a nothing episode because stuff does go on and whatnot but you know, um, it's just really in the first half I feel after episode 1 the writing does go a bit downhill 
and you have all that build up, then episode four comes along and you know that's where all the action goes down. I think had it been a different director that could have gone a very different way. Um, but luckily Douglas Canfield, I'm pretty sure it's Douglas Canfield, yeah. Um, he knows his stuff when it comes to this and you know, it does a very good action scene here. And you know, throughout this story as well, he's doing wonderful atmosphere scenes and providing lashings of atmosphere. Um, and then parts five and six, the writing sort of like takes a bit of a, not a turn for the worst, but it's not as up to quality. And, you know, um, ultimately these writers would only, these, at Mervyn Hainsman and another person I've forgotten the name of, uh, let's just have a quick look. Ooh. Dropping it now. Oh yeah, Mervyn Hainsman and Henry Lincoln. That's their names. And they would only go on to write one more, The Dominators. Um, quite hated by fans, but um, I actually am quite a big fan of The Dominators, really. I have a soft spot for it. I think it's a jolly good story. Uh, but anyway, you know, they would only go on, go on to write that one more story because of, um, well, that's something I could discuss in the review of the Dominators whenever I get round to doing one of those. Um, but yeah, Web of Fear, I feel that um, writing, it's not bad writing at all, it's, it's good writing, but not great writing. It is overrated, really, and I think, you know, not enough credit is given to... Um, the director here, Douglas Canfield, for writing all this atmosphere that he did and really taking a good script and turning it into a great production ultimately. So those are my thoughts on it. I was going to give it a 9 but I'm starting to think maybe an 8 for this one. I don't know. Um, you know, I'll be generous. I'll go 9. I did give the writing a bit of a bash there but it's not as bad as I made out. It is good writing but overrated writing, I will say, and ultimately direction is what really lifts that writing above and beyond and makes this one a 9 out of 10, um, rather than a 7, or it could even have been a 6 had it been a different director and had things not gone in that same atmospheric direction. So yeah, congratulations to all involved in this production, and you know, um, thank goodness we finally have it back, and... Well, I say finally, it's been back for over two years now, but it still feels odd to say that, doesn't it? Um, the Web of Fear, finally back with us, and I've now reviewed it. And yes, all that's left to say now is thank you all for watching. Next review will be of, um, what's it called? Shield of the Jot, and that's it, a Sixth Doctor main range release. And until then, I will see you all next time. Bye, everyone. More than likely, we may not be able to defeat this menace. Well, at London, in fact, the whole of England might be completely wiped out. Any attempt to interfere would be pointless. My Yeti can destroy you so easily. Uh, I'm sacrificed to all. And for what? Let's go!